ladies and gentlemen, in the blue corner, standing at a sleek 5'11", 245 pounds, the tumultuous tempest of technique, Thomas Lilly. And in the red corner, at a curvaceous 5'11", 315 pounds, the jovial juggernaut of judgment, John Cheryl Sheridan. A meeting of the masters of mastication. Turn your attention as they delve deep into all things lifting and more. This is Peak Speak. And we are live. That was a really good radio voice. Thank you. It's this mic. It just makes me sound so holy. Mm, it's good, isn't it? Mm. All right. We're back for another episode of Peak Speak. Peak uh, Speak. But- by the time you hear this, our episode before the Q&A will have been released. Will uh, it? I, I don't know if that's a guarantee we can make. Look, I have complete faith in our media team, Sam. As do I. It's less about the media team and more about our organizational skills. Yes, more so my ability to uh, upgrade my Google Drive to allow the maximum uploads. Yeah, well, if you weren't such a cheap bastard, you just paid for it earlier, we would be fine. Well, I'm a business owner and I'm Lebanese. It kind of comes with the territory. And I run a gym. That's racist. Which means means I'm inherently extremely poor and destitute. (laughs) What do you mean? You're not rolling in buckets of cash in the gym environment? (laughs) Who would have thought? One of my least favorite things that people do, and you know people do it because... People, more people want to own a gym than need to own a gym. But they like, they look in, look around the room, go, Oh, like your, your base membership's 40 bucks a week. There's 25 people in this room. Oh, like you're rolling in cash. Like, motherfuckers, you don't even understand half the expenses that go into running something like this and That's actually, right. actually keeping it afloat. And I had you the know same, makes- I was going to say, I had the same discussion with someone about uh, the difference between, being a gym owner and being a coach like if you really fucking love coaching and you really enjoy working with people one-on-one or in groups or whatever work for someone else don't don't open open, a gym yeah don't open a gym because you do way less coaching and way more owning a gym they're two different things it makes me think of in aladdin when jafar becomes a genie can i just say i love all of your disney references Thank you. Um, when Jafar becomes a, a genie and he gets all the cosmic power, then he forgets the implication that it comes with teeny mini witty. Uh, what is that? Teeny mini witty. <laughs> I can't say it. <laughs> teeny weeny living space. And he gets shoved into the lamp and that's it. They like banish him in the lamp forever. <laughs> oh, that was the best genie impression I've ever uh, seen. I got, a, I got a mic all of a sudden. I think I'm Robin Williams. I can't help it. Yeah, dude, you're definitely not Robin Williams. Like, I appreciate your attempts, but you're certainly not him. <laughs> um, so, while we're on the subject of bad impressions, I hear <laughs> there's a few things that are grinding your powerlifting gears, Thomas. Tell us about them. Yes, that didn't sound scripted at all. Not at uh, all. <clears throat> what do you mean? I'm not reading from my script right now. I don't know what you're talking about. So, for those of you who don't know... Uh, I was involved in the running of the IPF Oceanias recently. Originally, I was listed as meet director. I actually withdrew from my position as meet director uh, to remain neutral because I like to be Sweden. So I am completely neutral. I'm non-federated right now. How I like to be. This competition... Federated is not a word. Federated, Um, not a word. Powerlifting. Powerlifting is not a thing. So we can have things that aren't things within the thing that's not a thing. All right? valid point continue exactly so one thing that has driven me completely crazy is the disgusting federation bashing more so the individual bashing that's come from this because people have turned it into their personal war right so i'm not gonna get too much into the whole oceanius thing if you have questions about it message me if you have questions about any of the mechanics of it message me don't go out there spinning rumors that don't exist rumors that aren't true what had happened is that in the islands ipf was removed because opf was removed everybody knows this okay michael kingston who was the president of papua new guinean powerlifting 
was invited to be the president of the new Oceania Regional Powerlifting Federation, which he took on uh, as an interim position because all of the islands, uh, in in a fashion which was completely neutral in terms of, hey, do you want to go with IPF or do you want to go with world powerlifting? That was put to the people and the people decided where they want to go. Now, have a think about this for a second. Powerlifters are people. The people running powerlifting comps are people. They have choices. They're normal individuals just like you. To bash people for their choices about where they lift and how they lift and who they associate with you with is absolutely disgusting. And people were incredibly put down. I'm talking extreme personal attacks, people being called maggots, people being called scum, people having their families attacked. It's just gross, absolutely gross. So, you know, I, I made a post about this on uh, on my Instagram the other day because I saw, I was driving along, I coached the Papua New Guinean powerlifting team. I saw them chilling out, eating. They had arrived for Oceanis. I stopped and took a photo with them. And the absolute happiness and joy on their faces to be given the opportunity to be flown to Australia to compete at an international comp to represent their country when they've worked so hard in the conditions that... Uh, you know, completely the opposite of the conditions that we have here. For them to be attacked for choosing to compete in that federation because they have nowhere else to compete, no other option, because they as a people chose to stick with the IPF, for them to be put down for that? Think about the mechanics of that. It's just pathetic. So, my message is stop being spineless little worms. Accept the fact that we do this because we love powerlifting. The three little letters that come in front of your competitions don't matter to the most of the people that are actually creating all this bullshit. They're just stirring the pot for the sake of stirring the pot. Anyway, I'm stumbling over words. I'm getting hot and bothered. You do look rather red, and I kind of wish I'd managed to record that last little bit on my phone. That would have been a great snapshot, but we'll deal with that later. Uh, look, I can do nothing but concur with your message i think so much of this stuff and i i think as i've grown older and more mature in owning a business and being involved in a sport like powerlifting i've come to realize like actually i just don't care about any of it um mm -hmm. what i care about like you is is people being attacked for things they have or haven't done that have no real reflection on who they are as a person or things like that and i, th I actually think a lot of it comes back down to um identity right like i am a power lifter i am an ipf power lifter i am a gpc power lifter that people get so caught up in being involved in this thing that they it becomes part of who they are and then an attack not an even an attack but a statement against a particular federation or a person or a competition or whatever that may be becomes a personal attack like a, an attack to you to you as a person and who you identify as and I think that's the trap that a lot of people fall into. And this is where all this bullshit comes out about a sport that's so divided and so minuscule on a world scale. Yet there's so much, you know, just veracity around people just going crazy about it and getting so Especially caught up in bullshit internet arguments like fuck man we're all just lifting weights it's not actually that amazing you're not changing the world because you're a, a elite level power lifter maybe you've got a platform and a message to be able to spread but if all you fucking spread is hate and vitriol like what positive change are you bringing upon the world especially in this situation which was from a completely positive uh yes a, a completely positive motivation yeah. Like there, there was demand for this competition to happen. There was people ready to facilitate it. So it was facilitated. Yep. So the power lifters that wanted to do this competition could do this competition. Yeah. Like, there, there was no, no malice, no spite, no anti other federation involved with it because believe it or not, most people aren't that way. It's just the select minority group. The that vocal just minority. To, it's that just wants to create man. drama and problems. And you're yeah. right. It's like people with a platform, with a voice, just want to create drama. Well, not not everyone. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. But, you know, it seems like there's a, this select group that has this voice. And, it, oh, man, it's just bad, bad, bad news. 
and it's going to ruin the sport that we all love and it continues to ruin i should say the sport that we all love that like the general public don't actually give a fuck about unless mm. you're a powerlifter you don't know anything about this powerlifting drama like we're not fifa this isn't like some global corruption story this is a few little things that have some minor implications to a select group of people and on a like on a global scale and then we just get all these people preaching hate and us versus them it's silly just silly mm. absolutely let's just lift and have fun exactly maybe That's drink a I beer like. afterwards uh, uh, yeah yeah i don't think there's a depending there i think that's a Look, John, scientific fact if we're talking about identity i am an athlete are you though mm, no all right can we talk about something more positive or more useful to the people than just ranting certainly. about powerlifting politics certainly but bullshit. don't don't you feel better for it don't you feel a i do bit, yeah yeah it's nice um mm. So I suggested we do a little bit of work on talking about weight classes and weight cuts and body weight manipulation of all varieties that come with a sport that is a weight class based sport. There's no weight class in the jungle. Boom. <sighs> I would have been so much more impressed if you just dropped the mic and just walked out the door. Like that would have been. That's perfect. right. But, That's um, right. you know, can't have everything. Uh, a, that that was a throwback to Kevin Huang. He used to say that every day. Anyway, most people won't get that reference. Continue, no, please. Spew for Kev. Oh, fuck. That was the funniest <laughs> thing ever. Um, anyway, so weight classes. Um, I have some fairly firm views on, on weight classes for novice lifters. And that's what I sort of want to start this discussion with is, is a discussion about when it's worth worrying about your body weight. Uh, to preface this, I would like to tell a story about my first comp, uh, in, in 2010, it was, uh, battle of the gyms at, at what was then elite physique. Uh, it was the only powerlifting comp in Canberra at the time. Um, and it was just like a novice comp, right? An unaffiliated gym comp. Uh, my exposure prior to that to powerlifting had almost been exclusively through elite FTS and the Q and a section and, uh, essentially like lots of multiply equip stuff in, in the U S because that was sort of what was still big at, at that point, uh, in powerlifting in the internet land that is powerlifting. Um, and so I'd like read about weight cuts and, and, and weight classes and things like that. And, uh, so at the time I was still playing rugby. So I was a much more felt like 108, 106, something like that. Sweet. And, uh, yeah, I haven't been that light in a while. Um, but I'm way stronger now, so it's fine. Uh, so I was like, oh, like, I'll cut weight. I'll be in the hundreds. I'll be really strong. And, like, I'll win the weight class and it'll be great. And I had read no actual science or any real instruction about weight cutting and, like, water cuts and, and things like that. But I knew you had to just, like, not drink water and sweat a lot. So, uh, I just stopped drinking water like two days out from, <laughs> from the, the comp. Maybe it was, a, yeah, it was like two days out and I just like sat in hot baths. I used pretty much an entire water tank worth of hot water in my house. <laughs> uh, I lived at home with my parents at the time and my brothers. They would love that. Yeah. My brother still tells the story about how I, uh, used all the hot water in the house and two thirds of a roll of glad wrap. <laughs> um and so like my brother came home and found me on the couch in a tracksuit with like glad wrap wrapped around me but uh someone had also told me that or i'd read somewhere that like if you're really struggling i think it was actually matt croc uh, <laughs> if you're really struggling like a few ice chips can help you uh like, yeah, yeah. you know get through the dehydration thing i extrapolated from ice chips to zuper dupers because i was like well at least it's got some flavor um and so i ended up eating like seven zuper dupers because i hadn't eaten anything all day and i was really fucking thirsty uh i ended up like weighing in at 102 or something like i missed by an absolute mile uh and oh, i had yeah. no fucking idea about what i was doing and it makes for a funny story now but it's an experience that i don't want new lifters to go through because it was a really stressful experience it definitely had an impact upon my performance on the day yeah. and it was just something to worry about that at that level i shouldn't have been worried about because ultimately 
in your first comp, what you weigh doesn't actually matter. Uh, yeah. We were just talking off camera. Next year, I think I'm going to remove weigh-ins completely from our novice powerlifting comps and just uh, pick winners based on totals, uh, which I understand has an implication for or a, a sort of bias against smaller, lighter lifters. But despite the fact that we don't use weight classes and we just use gloss Brenner currently to pick winners, uh, I still get so many people asking about weight classes, wanting to know what people at a particular body weight are lifting, wanting to manipulate their body weight to fit into some artificial category that doesn't actually exist anyway in the novice comp. And mm-hmm. so for me, the, the novice comps and the reason we run novice comps is to expose as many people as we can to the sport mm-hmm. and, and to lower the barrier to entry. So I think if we can remove one of those factors that people are going to stress about regardless. Uh, if we can remove the impetus to change your body weight in any way completely and the relevance of body weight in that particular case, then uh, I think everything would be better off. Um, See, I don't actually, I don't actually completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, I think it's important for me to say that because we always agree on everything on the podcast and everyone wants to see we us do, and hate each other. We do other. in the vast majority of times. <laughs> and I appreciate that you don't agree with it. And I'd like to hear why. Yeah. Yeah, so f- for a start, like there's no weight classes anyway. So, uh, and, and you know, we both run novice comps. We both have different experiences with our novice comps. You actually run quite a few more comps than me and you're probably a better meat director and, and meat promoter than me. So you've, you've got a bit more experience in that regard. Um, but when people ask me, what are the weight classes and should I cut weight and all that? So I just say there's no weight classes. And yeah. the, the implication is that they will weigh in. Uh, but there are no classes to shoot for anyway. So cutting weight is kind of futile. And I tell them that, you know, by cutting, I'd rather answer those questions and still give them the experience of having to weigh in because it's more of a flavor of what a comp's actually going to be like uh, and still use formula to create a bit more of an even playing field. Because if we're talking barrier for entry, if you've got a, like a little 40 kilo girl that's scared that she's not going to be anywhere near what she needs to be to beat the... 110 kilo girl that's entering her friend uh it might stop her from entering um and uh, i mean you're gonna have the same issues if you go the other way around as well like yeah. you just uh you know that's how you've justified getting to this place it's yeah just, I don't and, think I'm and that's the thing for me for my novice uh, comps. i've like i've done that since we started running comps in like 2013 that's the exact same spiel i give to people is your weight doesn't matter we use a formula that just compares everyone in a relatively even fashion you then have to explain what the formula is and why we use it the other thing i've experienced is a few people who and it tends to be women more than men but a few people who are uncomfortable with the concept of being weighed in uh and uncomfortable with knowing what that number is because for whatever Mm -hmm. reason and often it's because they've had a negative association with their relationship with that number in the past and that for me i think is probably a bigger hurdle than oh well you don't like we're just not going to weigh you in at all or it's in a weight class or things like that Mm -hmm. uh yeah and i certainly like i haven't made this decision completely yet but i'm leaning more and more towards it um and this is why i like having discussions like this is because it helps me solidify my thinking um but yeah i i think i i definitely agree with you there's a as an advantage and a disadvantage to both uh and i think the advantage to opening the door to people who don't need to be weighed in uh the other reason that has come to light more recently is because we're uh opening up the mx division for transgender intersex and non-binary people Mm. um we don't have a formula for that so the formulas we currently have are gendered into male and female because they're based on data for those of you that don't know how these formulas work it's essentially they just take a bunch of results and they create a huge scatter graph and they find the line of best fit and they use that equation and that's how you get the formula which averages yeah. people out across weight classes or that's my understanding at least it might be yeah. the the actual application might be slightly different but we don't have a formula for a transgender class i imagine perhaps 10 years down the track we can have a formula because we've got the data to pull from at that point mm-hmm. but in the interest of fairness and opening the door to that side of you know the sport that currently doesn't exist i think not having the way in allows us to just put that to one side until we've got a a way of dealing with it that's more fair and just going with biggest total wins 
Yeah. So yeah, fair um, enough. I'm, I'm keen to see how it uh, how it pans out. Yeah, look, and if we do it for a couple of comps and people scream and hate about it, um, that's fine. We'll, we'll yeah. maybe we'll change things, maybe we won't. But currently, my that's... other my other thinking around it as well is that like if someone asks you, okay, well, should I cut? And you say no, and then they cut anyway. They want to be be making those mistakes at novice comps rather than not having that experience. Get it, like doing the dumb shit at novice comps. That's what novice comps are for. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you're not going to plan how you're going to structure novice comps on that you know, unique one or two people that's exactly. going to do a stupid cut. And so I, I, get, I get your logic. And as it stands, I've got a great story about that time I did the dumb shit. And I hope mm-hmm. that my telling of that story is enough to convince people not to do the dumb shit. Mm. And, you know, people are going to do dumb shit regardless. You can't um, protect the world from people doing dumb shit. At least uh-huh. not in a 100% way. Um, so that was a long and roundabout way of approaching the idea that as a novice, I think we both agree that your body weight should be largely irrelevant. It should just, the focus should be on being stronger and getting better at the skill of lifting weights. Mm. At what point do you think a lifter should start to consider manipulating their body weight to change which weight class they're in? Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things that come into play. Like when you start lifting, when you start lifting, it's just like lift in whatever weight class you're in. Don't worry about your weight so much. Uh, and there's going to be a little bit of a gray area there. You know, some people get into lifting or powerlifting because they want to change their body weight up or down. That's fair enough. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but stressing about weight cuts for competition, the question you always have to ask is why am I cutting weight? Why do I need to be in this class? So if your only reason to cut weight to go into a particular class is because you want to be associated with that number, that's not a good enough reason. Exactly. Um, If it's cutting a tiny bit of weight to make a class to qualify for a bigger competition, that might be enough reason. When we're talking more extreme cuts, like, you know, uh, above 7% of your body weight for a 24-hour weigh-in, there's very few circumstances where that is kind of justifiable, uh, where the risk-reward ratio would say, okay, that's the right thing to do. And it's when it's when there's a lot on the line. If it's a national title... There's a bit more. Uh, there's a bit more reason to do that. If it's for a local competition where the the biggest prize you're going to get is a twenty dollar gold medal, it's probably not worth putting your body through that. Um, a, a couple of things come into play when you're picking a weight class as well. Is that ideally uh, you're going to be as lean as you can within that weight class. And the nature of lifting weights is that over time you're going to grow. Your body shape is going to change. Your muscles are going to get bigger. All that sort of stuff. And and A lot of the time I deal with people who outgrow their weight class and then perpetually hold themselves back from progress because they're so obsessed with the number that (coughs) they've aligned their powerlifting quote unquote career to. So if you're a 90 kilo lifter and you know, you're used to cutting from 93, then 94, 95, 96, 97, you start to push a hundred kilos and then you're like, I'm getting too heavy. I need to stick around 97 because that's where I cut from. And then you start cutting out food and you're perpetually in the calorie deficit. You you eventually, it becomes self-limiting and you'll notice that your numbers numbers start to really stagnate. They never really change. And it's about when, when do you make the decision to go the upper weight class is when you've outgrown it. When, when you're holding yourself back actively to meet this imaginary number. Um, Yeah. I think when, when you get to that point and you start, like you're eating at, a rate that means you just can't help but put on weight like that's mm-hmm. probably a good indicator that you know you need to go up a weight class like if you mm-hmm. like you said if you you walk around it and i had a i have a guy who had this problem walking around at like 95 to 97 and he'd cut to the 90s and then compete and then shortly after the comp he'd have ballooned back up just not through actively trying or anything but just going back to eating normally put him straight back up there again. It's like, well, man, maybe you need to just like take a year off competing and worry about l- worry less about being competitive in the weight class and more about your long-term potential. And I think that's where people get lost in this idea. It's, it's that idea of identity. It's I'm a hundred kilo lifter. I'm a 110 kilo lifter or whatever it is that it shouldn't be about that. It should be about being the strongest lifter you can be for the longest amount of time. And at a certain point, you kind of have to go up in weight classes. You, you just grow mm-hmm. out of them. Ed Cohn's yeah. the greatest example of this. Like, didn't he start in the 82s and ended up... Yep. It was Did he start in the 75s maybe? And 
I ended think his up, first meet was in the 75s and ended up in the 110s. Yeah, over 20 years. And that's the bit that people don't look at is like, this is a fucking macro scale discussion mm-hmm. is where are you strongest? Um, because mm-hmm. for the vast majority of you, that's probably going to be heavier than where you're competitive after three years of lifting. Mm-hmm. You see the same problem in the opposite direction as well when someone's like, okay, well, I'm not going to be a 90 kilo lifter anymore. I'm going to be a 100 kilo lifter. So I need to eat up and get to 100 kilos. It, it, it's really easy to simplify this by just looking at the, you know, uh, what's happening at a nutrition bio, biochemical sort of level. It's like if you eat in a calorie surplus, you'll get benefits of, you know, uh, rates of growth of all tissue, so fat and ma- muscle, you'll get increased recovery. You'll get all the benefits of being in a calorie surplus. But if you're in too much of a surplus, you're just going to get fat. Like there's there's only a, a certain rate that you can actually grow muscle tissue at. Any excess is going to be stored as fat. And it's not a dose-response relationship. People think that if they eat more and put on more weight faster, that their lifting will go up. You, you, your rate of strength improvement is kind of limited. It's, yep. it's not exponential. It's not a dose response with how much you eat. It's not like eating just magically makes you stronger. So when it's you're also, moving up... No- it's also on that note, uh, not uh, even across all three lifts. Mm-hmm. So like if you look at the results of the super heavyweights compared to the results of the lighter classes, generally the super heavyweights will have a higher proportion of their total made up of squats and bench than they will of deadlifts because at a certain point, your body gets in the way. Like you just can't deadlift right. as well because there's so much mass between you and the bar that it, it becomes the rate limiting factor. I think Ed's, Ed Cohn has said something to the effect of to find the heavier, the, your ideal weight class, you should keep gaining weight and maintain, like getting stronger until the point where your deadlift stops going up in relation to your body weight. <laughs> um, because yeah, that's, so- that's your ideal point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and so that, that's a big thing as well. You gain weight too fast. Things are going to change mechanically. You get more body approximation. You get more things hitting other things. You get an immediate benefit of a, of, a, of a slight crutch of stability just by having more cushioning around joints and stuff like that. Cushioning However, for the pushing. Oh, Jesus Christ. However, fat is not active tissue. Fat is not going to move weight. Stop, please stop. Uh, he's raising his eyebrows for the people listening and it's extremely seductive, seductive. Mm. Mm. <laughs> all right that was Sam, I got we out. took it too far um yeah so gaining weight too fast is, is not going to be a good thing and what you'll end up finding that you do is you fill out your weight class too fast you're just fat and then you've got all this because again uh holding fat is not going to make you lift more weight now that's not to say be as lean as possible year round it's uh, because everyone from a genetic perspective is going to be different rates of leanness comfortably yes so uh, you know, some people just walk around at a slightly higher body fat than other people, and that's their comfortable kind of zone. You know, yeah. Uh, so, so don't get caught up in numbers and percentages and all that kind of stuff. It's more about, uh, you know, what what can you gain weight comfortably at? What's comfortable body weight do you sit at? If you're perpetually holding yourself back by having to eat less because you need to be this imaginary body fat percentage. Uh, you're not going to get any stronger and you're not going to go anywhere. The other thing is if you gain weight too fast and overshoot your weight class and then think, oh, I've gotten too fat, I need to eat in a calorie deficit, the more time you spend in a deficit, the less time you spend getting stronger. Ideally, you want to be sitting around maintenance, maybe a slight surplus if you've got that room to play with. Yeah, and I think on the being too lean thing, it's especially relevant for the female population because your body fat, uh, as a female plays such a significant role in your hormone cycle uh if you get to a point where you're hi buddy i can see buddy behind you it's real cute uh uh-huh. when you're perpetually holding yourself in that deficit and maintaining an incredibly low body fat percentage the hormonal repercussions are huge and that starts to have a negative impact upon your performance your recovery all of those sort of things that, again, come back to this idea of limiting your potential in the long term. Mm-hmm. Um, so once you've decided on where you feel like you sit comfortably, uh, can you talk to us about at what point you think weight cutting becomes a, a relevant thing? Like this, this idea that everyone should sit above their weight class and cut down to whatever their weight class is, has, I think, become a really common 
uh, thing in, in powerlifting, at least in my experience over the last few years. And I don't know if a lot of these people need to be cutting weight. Like, mm-hmm. do you need to be cutting weight three times a year for a local meet? And when you're a you know class three lifter who isn't actually competitive on a national scale? No, I don't. I don't think it's all that relevant. Sorry, my thing just stopped recording. Okay. Excellent. Hold on. Let's uh, before we go any further. Let's pause while I go and get my uh, computer charger so my computer doesn't die. Okay, I'll, I'll be back. Sweet. Uh, so weight so- cuts. I think weight cuts or well I don't think I'd I'd say weight cuts are more relevant to your experience uh, and your uh, ranking in the powerlifting world if you're a high level powerlifter there's more justification for you to cut weights because there's generally uh, cut weight because there's generally generally more at stake the less at stake the less relevance there is to doing weight cuts especially the more extreme weight cuts and, and people think that it's some sort of skill that they need to learn and have. So I, I, I hear a lot of people that are just like, oh, I need it for the experience. I'm like, you don't need anything in, in that regard. You, you know, you, you need the experience when you need the experience. And right now, you don't need the experience. It's not just a skill to have. It's, it's a little bit more volatile than that. And uh, I, I think people really underestimate how much it can in impact on performance especially when it's done poorly and a lot of the times i see it done really poorly uh so when you're going to cut weight is more i would say a product of uh your experience and what's at stake i don't know what do you think on that yeah look i tend to agree with you i think um if if you've been competing for a few years and you're beginning to be competitive or at least your numbers suggest you could be competitive in a weight class that's perhaps a little bit below where you sit naturally, then you can start to talk about it. But if you're the person that, you know, you've been powerlifting for two years and you're worried about putting on an extra two kilos because it's going to make that cut down to the 100 kilo weight class too hard for you, but you're in the top 30 you know, or the bottom half of the top 30 in the country, you probably don't need to worry about cutting weight. You probably need to worry about getting stronger and Mm -hmm. reaping the rewards that come from the low hanging fruit. Like that's the, the thing that I think people miss in this is weight cuts are that 1%. It's the thing that when you're at an elite level, you're approaching an elite level can make the difference between, you know, uh, like third place and, and first or things like that, you know, but for the vast majority of powerlifters, I would suggest it's probably approaching 90% of powerlifters in the world. You don't need to worry about what you weigh. You need to worry about being a better powerlifter and Mm -hmm. getting to a point where you are at your strongest and can put together the best package possible on the platform on competition day. Once that package becomes competitive or begins to look like it's becoming competitive, you can talk about cutting weight. But yeah, I just, I've seen so many people suffer through like you said, just really poor weight cuts. And I mean, I've done it myself as well, but Mm -hmm. after that first experience, the only times I cut weight, uh, I never cut more than like four or five kilos. And every time I did, I won gold at at Mm -hmm. nationals. Like it was a, I cut into my weight class and I won. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I'll tell you something below that, silly. I'll tell you something that really pisses me off. And I, this was actually one of my original Tom Bro on a Plane Instagram stories. Excellent. Uh, is that when, when people wear uh, weight cuts as a badge of honor yeah. by like, you know, two weeks out eating meat pies and going out for massive like pasta carbonara dishes and being like, oh, got to make weight in two weeks. It's like, you, it, and it's, it's almost like in those people, they're, they're bragging about their ability to cut weight, but at the same time, they're preemptively preparing their excuse for why they performed poorly because they did a massive weight cut it's like a it's exactly. like a double edge so it's like a oh. you know it's a contingency plan and a humble brag at the same time it's it's really fucking annoying so um, many people uh oh like i could have performed better if i didn't cut weight then yeah. why the fuck did you cut weight because yeah. the thing because is I- anyone who's cutting weight at a high level knows that there is a performance an impact upon your performance and like you said earlier it's about the risk reward if you're cutting 12 percent of your body weight for a local meet it's fucking oath it's going to affect your performance but what's the point like what do you get out of it 
the other thing is like especially in those high level lifters and especially at the ones that complain about their weight cut after a big comp like a nationals it's like you knew about nationals 11 months before when they nas- when they announced it at the previous nationals don't Preach. sit there and act like you didn't have the time to be more prepared so you didn't get fucked over by your weight class exactly. weight cut sorry so that raises a good question when like uh Uh, or it raises a good point which is you need to be prepared if you know you're going to cut weight you need to set yourself a buffer zone that you're going to cut from and don't exceed that buffer zone and you want to be in that zone like 10 to 12 weeks out because trying to peak or even trying to develop strength in a deficit just will not work you're just going to have a bad time especially the more experienced you are so if you know you're cutting from 95 down to 90 you need to be 95 or less 10 to 12 weeks out don't sit at 100 and be like, I can cut from 95, so I just have to get to 95 and aim for that two weeks out. Be there early so you can coast through your prep and actually get stronger. Exactly. And I think that's where the discussion begins to um, differ between people with a 24-hour weigh-in and a two-hour weigh-in. Now, mm-hmm. before going too deeply into that, I'd like to propose our thoughts on the process. Uh, to be honest, I think 24-hour weigh-ins are dumb. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think the like four or to six hour windows probably a more effective way to do it it makes starting comps first thing in the morning much harder but Mm -hmm. um just the amount of people that love 24 hour weight cuts and being all like oh yes i'm gonna get heaps out of this weight cut and i'm actually gonna end up 15 kilos heavier on the day and yeah I, i think it's a dumb part of the sport i it is part of the sport so if you have the ability to cut for 24 hour weigh-ins by all means utilize it I just think it's a part of the sport I'd rather not see. What about you? Yeah, uh, I'm definitely team two hour way, and I, I much prefer a two hour way in same yeah. day. I think it's, I think it's cleaner. I think it's a better. Uh, like I, I definitely appreciate the skill of a weight cut oh, uh, yeah. when it's done right, and uh, you know I appreciate that within the rules within that opportunity, it's okay to do that situation. I just hate the battle of extremes that don't actually apply to the actual competition. So like, you know, the yeah. battle of who can cut more weight to get in this class, the battle, of, you know, it just seems a bit pointless. The other thing like uh, as a it's kind a of long term health risk as well. Yeah, well, not even long term, man. So this is what I was about to spin off is that yeah. the, the risk involved in heavy weight cuts is, is probably understated. So, you know, powerlifting is an underground sport that no one really cares about look at something like ufc where they're moving towards you know banning these ridiculous cuts i have we have a massive hospital just around the corner from the gym and i've got several staff that work there you only have to hear a couple of horror stories of like people cutting for local uf uh uh, mma fights that have tried to cut into like a 67 kilo class and these are just kids you know cutting for a local competition that doesn't mean anything they're not winning any money there's been at least two people that have either died or cooked themselves to the point where they complete vegetables for the rest of their life just by doing these ridiculous weight cuts uh and it's it, it can be really dangerous so can the rehydrate the the water loading process can be dangerous if because you hear some really fucking stupid advice like 10 drink 10 liters of distilled water a day you can really cook yourself doing stuff like that and it's just not scientific and not correct yeah. um I, I like i don't think we really have time in this episode to delve deep into the actual process of the no I, We're just talking and i think more it's about it i think it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today anyway but yeah, yeah it yeah. is certainly important to recognize that this is an incredibly risky thing to be doing especially as you get higher up in the percentages yeah um, and you, sh- it, and you it should can... be doing it under the advice of someone who knows what they're doing that's the point right because there's so much it, it's it's high risk but it is easy to get right but there's so much misinformation out there yeah. and stupid information about out there and you know bear in mind that the average person uh, you know, the average person probably wouldn't withstand a weight cut. People with that get drawn to these kind of sports tend to have a little bit of a, a flick switched in their brain. They tend to be a little bit more I like uh, of an athletic flick switched. Yeah, they, they, they tend to be a, a little bit more of an athletic mindset. And someone of that mindset will do anything to reach the end goal. They will go through the discomfort because there is nothing comfortable of or fun about a weight cut and. On top of that, the refeed process, I would say, is even more uncomfortable than the actual weight cut when you do an extreme weight cut. Like yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's not a fun time in either regard. And it does, I don't care how tough you are. No one gets it easy when they're doing big weight cuts. No. Um, and the thing with these people that are really athletic, really driven is that they don't care about that discomfort and they'll ignore signs of things 
breaking and going wrong and can really do some damage, which is why people end up in those sorts of situations. But yeah, man, we, it's kind of like... We had a guy, uh, the same guy I was talking about earlier, who was cutting from like 95 to 97 down to the 90s. Nationals, not last year, year before. Mm-hmm. Uh he ended up through an unrelated issue in hospital a few weeks out uh lost a bunch of weight in hospital because he couldn't maintain his eating schedule uh then overfed and put too much weight back on tried the same process that he has done before and knows works and has consistently worked pretty well for him uh and he didn't make it he got to like 90 point four or something and i'd like checked on him a few times he was with his girlfriend at the time like in and out of a sauna and he arrived to weigh him in in a room that was maybe 15 meters long like the warm-up room at the frankston arts center he he lost me in the crowd like he couldn't see far enough properly to track me through a crowd he couldn't form a sentence he bent over to put his uh, to take his shoes off and everything started cramping he could barely stand up stood on the scales and he was 400 grams over i said dude you're done like you just can't do this anymore you're gonna die like he's delirious Mm -hmm. he he can't hold a conversation coherently he was like gray and looked like he was gonna die i said dude like that's it you you've just missed it it's we're done i'm not letting you go any further uh, mm-hmm. his girlfriend at the time suggests like, oh no, you like, you can do this. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 can't. He like, this is it. We've tried. This is as far down this road as I'm willing to let you go. The second he started drinking, the fucking color came back to his skin. 15, yeah. 20 minutes later, he could speak to me coherently again. He's still exhausted and tired and in pain and all these sort of things, but he didn't sound like he was going to die anymore. And he mm. came back the next day and still performed suboptimally because that weight cut's a draining process. But in the process, mm. he put this huge risk upon his life for a fucking powerlifting competition. Like, it's yeah, fuck, It's yeah. not UFC. Like, no one's getting paid millions of dollars. And even at that level, is your life really worth the millions of dollars they're going to pay you to get punched in the face? But <laughs> that's a discussion for another day. But from a powerlifting perspective, like, it's just fucking powerlifting, guys, girls. Mm-hmm people it's just fucking powerlifting don't put your life on the line for a sport that no one cares about yeah 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 my camera stopped recording it's all full excellent so i feel like that's a good place to finish things then Uh, organization goals yeah well we can just have the media team put out like a old school tv black and white system error thing on your side of the youtube screen keep recording the audio and uh, we'll finish things off well, with the girl from Ipanema playing. Sounds great. She passes, when she passes, goes, ah. That's perfect. Uh, that's that's about it from us today, yeah, I think, folks. I mean, we could talk about weight cut stuff for uh, for hours. Like, there's, there's a lot to discuss on the subject. I think the, the, the take-home message is kind of like, if you're unsure about what to do with your weight... Talk to someone who knows. Like, there's, yep. there are plenty of good coaches and good lifters around that are mature in this kind of stuff. Flick us a message. We're, we're happy to give you some advice. More on, than happy. Uh, Here's what weight sp- class to choose, how to spoiler choose Spoiler alert. All of that. My first question is going to be why? Yeah. Because almost exactly. always people are like, oh, which weight class should I compete in? This one or this one? Why? Like, why, why? are you choosing yeah. those two weight classes? Because that's how you get to uh-huh. the bottom of these questions, right? Is that's, not that's getting caught up in that r- number. The all-time record is 350 kilo squat and my squat at the moment is 220, so I reckon I've got it. Perfect. Uh, six weeks German volume training, you'll be sweet. <laughs> GBT. Done GBT. GBT. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, flick us a message. Ask us questions. That's what we like to do. As always, I think uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, you got something out of it, please tell your friends, give us a five-star oh, review or five give us stars. a one-star review and be that anonymous hater that we all love. Uh, that's fine too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Instagram shares, we love that. Yes, share it. tag Post us. It stories, tag us in your stories. Uh, I'm at Just Shero on Instagram. Uh, you can also find my gym at Burley Strength. Thomas, where can people find you? At Tombro Seven at zero underscore weakness. The zero name is taken by some random guy that hasn't posted for like four years, and I really want it, and he just won't respond to messages. So zero, I tried. I you're, tried to buy. You're out there listening. I tried to Please. buy johnsheridan.com a while ago and yeah, some dude owns it 
and he's like some <laughs> shady real estate salesman in the US. It's um it's annoying. <laughs> and I have a suspicion my dad might own John Sheridan.com.au but just doesn't have anything on it. Um, yeah, because he's that kind of person. Is your dad a John as well? Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. Oh, there you go. He's John my, Mur- Murdoch. I'm John Richmond. My da- my dad's Thomas. So there you go. Yeah, I, I bucked a fairly substantial, uh, a fairly long-standing family tradition in not naming my firstborn son John. Um, That's all right. Well, technically, he's not a Sheridan, so it doesn't count. That's all good. Exactly. Um, all right. Thank you, people. Tune yes. in next time. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>